I will tell you a tale of the Seventh, a battalion we looked on with pride. I will tell of the valour of comrades who for king and country have died. We had been for some ten months in training and found it was work and not play. You may guess that each man was delighted when we learned we were going away. We had all said goodbye to our loved ones ere we set out for over the main. And I'll tell you, the boys were quite happy on the morn we stepped into the train. At least at one instant, an officer actually shot a soldier to prevent him being burned alive. Lesser of two evils. It's part of Lee's history and the worst British rail accident. Just unbelievable. What a horrendous situation for everybody involved. It's part of our history. It was Britain's worst rail disaster, and I think it always will be. It was such an unnecessary death. It was a simple train crash, which shouldn't have happened. On the morning of Saturday, the 22nd of May, 1915, the 1st 7th Leith Battalion of the Royal Scots, having concentrated in the Larbert area for training and trained to go to Liverpool to board a troop ship to go to Gallipoli. There were three trains involved and the first one, carrying 498 all ranks, left Larbert Station at 3.45 in the morning. It was running late, it was trying to make up time as it approached Gretna. At that time, there was a signal box at Quintons Hill and four rail tracks ran past. The main line to London, the main line up to Glasgow and two passing loops where trains could be parked to allow priority traffic through. In one of the passing loops was parked an empty train of coal wagons. In the other one was parked a goods train going north. And in the middle came a local train heading from Carlisle to Carstairs. It had to be parked to allow the express running late from London to go through and almost forgotten by the signalman, the troop train coming south. It was therefore parked on the southbound line, opposite line to which it was facing and the line on which the troop train was approaching. At 6.49, the troop train came under the bridge about 200 yards from the signal box and that was the first time the driver would have seen this train in his way. He slammed on the brakes, but really very little effect in that time, and the troop train ploughed into the local train. The impact between the troop train travelling fast and the stationary local passenger train facing the opposite direction pushed the whole train about 200 yards up the line. And then you got telescoping because these wooden carriages just disintegrated and telescoped one inside the other. And you got a pile up of these carriages, many instantly killed, a lot of them trapped. The troop train was about 300 yards long. After the impact, it was less than 160 yards long. Most of us, having been up all night, were sleeping when the trains collided. The first thing I remember was rifles falling on me from the rack, and suddenly all went dark. I fell through the bottom of the carriage and was badly crushed. One minute later, the express going towards Glasgow piled into the wreckage and the effect of the hot coals from the express engine, the wooden carriages that the troop train was consisting of, which had gas cylinders underneath to light the carriages, resulted in a devastating and horrific fire. And you can imagine the noise and the shouts and the yells and the steam and the, when you think of the thing in your mind again, it was a horrendous situation. And of course, in the middle of that, the two signalmen suddenly realising they didn't made a, a fatal error. Terrible. The total result were 216 members of the battalion killed, the vast majority burnt to death, only 83 of the 216 bodies were actually identified. The further 12 were killed on the express 
and the local train, making 228 killed all told, still the worst accident in the history of British Railways. On top of that, 220 members of the battalion and a number of others on the other local train were injured, many of them very, very seriously. A horrific, terrible accident, uh, but what marked it was it was on a morning when they were heading for war, they weren't at war, and they were within such a close distance to their own homes. When the war began in 1914, Leith at that time was an independent town, independent from Edinburgh, and they had something like about 82,000 people actually stayed in the town of Leith. Of that, over the period of the war, something like 14,400 men and some women actually volunteered for the forces and they went off. Leith was a working area. I mean, it wasn't just the docks. There was the potteries they had in Leith, there was the breweries they had in Leith, the whisky distilling and the whisky storage in Leith, the bottle making, the grain mills, there was the paper mills along the water of Leith. The town was really quite a large industrial town. Edinburgh tended to be a wee bit more gentrified where it was all the banks and lawyers and things of that nature. Leith was very proud of its trams. They had electric trams long before Edinburgh, which finished at Poolrig. They had their own local council, with their own province, their own police force, their own bank, the Leith Bank, the building still stands. And there was quite a lot of friendly rivalry, shall I say, between Leith and Edinburgh, particularly fundraising. For instance, in one case, in 1918, when they were sending tanks around the town, to try and raise money from people in war bonds. Leith was very proud to contribute, on average, £21 per capita. Edinburgh only was able to pay £14 per capita. So there was all these little rivalries going on between Leith and Edinburgh. In addition to having its own tram system, Leith had three major train stations. There was a central station at the foot of Leith Lock, there was Leith North, which is on Commercial Street, and then there was North Leith, which was just outside the docks. So it had three major routes that existed at the time. Eventually, all these stations have disappeared over the last 40-odd years, I'd say. They've all gone, and the rail lines that went throughout Leith, very, very few of them remain now. The battalion was a very local battalion. It recruited from Leith, essentially, some from Portobello, and a number from Musselburgh, particularly in A Company, which was one of the companies involved in the crash. And that concentrated the loss, whereas many of the other battalions at that time, which had been involved in action in France, drew from a much wider area and didn't make the impact so local. It was said at the time that there wasn't a family in Leith untouched by the tragedy. And certainly if you look at some of the areas they came from, Albert Street, the number who were killed from that one street, everybody must have known those who were killed, many of them related to them. Then there were cases of fathers and sons, brothers, cousins, workmates involved in the battalion. So that spread out within a small community of a firm or a business where possibly one, two or three were involved, not necessarily all killed. But again, that made it very, very local. My grandfather was Alexander Thompson and he was a private in the Royal Scots. He was a TA, Territorial Army, until August of 1914 when he became part of the regular army and was serving with the Royal Scots based in the drill hall at Dalmeny Street. 
three of the family were involved in the Gretna troop train disaster. That was my grandfather and two of my uncles. One of the uncles, Uncle John, was killed in the troop train disaster and his younger brother Peter was a survivor and my grandfather arrived in Gretna in a slightly later train, so wasn't involved in the disaster. My relative was John Brown McGurk and he was in the Royal Scots and he was a survivor of the crash and he ended up hanging in a window and the floor beneath him went, so that probably saved him. He remembers lying in a field at Gretna and someone rifling through his pockets. He thought they were stealing his money, but they were probably looking for ID. I've been researching my family history over a period of years, and in my researches I discovered that there were eight sons that were serving in the army. The youngest one was 18, which was my father, and my eldest was my uncle William, who was aged 39. Sadly, one of the brothers, my uncle Robert, didn't get as far as a campaign because his life was cut short at the Gretna train disaster in 1915. My grandfather was trying to sleep, but not really sleeping on the train. It was the early hours of the morning. He was very interested in what was going around. He actually told us about when the train stopped at an earlier station just very briefly. And they were out looking out the window, looking at the people on the platform, trying to work out where they were and where exactly they were going. So we get the idea that he probably wasn't fully asleep when the crash happened and because of that, that probably saved his life. Well, my father was Robert Cumming who came round about the middle with, with his twin brother George of a family of 11 surviving children. So it was his older brother, Peter, who survived and the oldest boy in the family, John, who was killed in the troop train disaster. The train concertina to such an extent that the doors were jammed, this, the roofs peeled off, and if you were awake and active, you were able, luckily, to be able to scramble out. And that's what happened to him because within a very short period, the train was on fire. He was already outside the train. So then they went back to try and see who they could help. And for the rest of the day, that was what he did. They helped who they could, they got who they could out of the train, but then they tried to do first aid. People came with sheets, and bandages, trying to help. But he spent most of the day helping who he could, and then they were detailed to actually gather together as much equipment as they could find, cleaning blood off it to see what was left of the battalion. Um, what could be used because, of course, the idea was, well, they're moving on. They still have to go. They have their orders. And that's what he did for the rest of the day until they took in a, a roll call and he was one of a few. It's in a quite a famous photograph of just a few men who were fit enough to have very minor scratches but actually be able to take the roll call. Um, a very long, very hard and very distressing day. All that could be found to account for many another brave-hearted soldier was a fragment of bloodstained clothing, a pipe or pouch, a notebook, or perhaps a handful of buttons. During the roll call taken by the railside on the Sunday afternoon, out of all that trainload of eager soldiers, only 58 were able to answer to their names. More than 200 had been killed and 200 injured, of whom only a handful were not of the Royal Scots. I don't know whether he was burned or whether it was as a result of the carriages being compacted, but he was taken to Carlisle Hospital and that's where he died, the same day as the accident. Carlisle Hospital was full of the really seriously wounded. They then transferred him to Preston. He was 29 when he died. I mean, he was one of the older soldiers, really, because a lot of them were only 17 and 
18. My grandmother died in 1915. Uh, she had a stroke, having so many sons put a great strain on her, and she succumbed to her illness. I know there was a boy and he was 16. I know he died in the crash. Too young. He used to go to the territorials with his father and his brother and story has it that my grandmother was quite annoyed at this because he was only about 14 and she used to come to the drill hall and take him home. When they went to the war he was 14 and six months old and he didn't lie about his age because it's on the paperwork you know that the recruiting officer had written down his age although he must have got caught out at some point that he was very young but of course he was very tall. When the war started in August of 1914 he wasn't even 17 and it was a few weeks before his 17th birthday so that meant that by the time the crash happened he was still only 17 and strictly speaking shouldn't have even really been on the train but as we found through our research, that wasn't uncommon. After they took the roll call, of course, the army being the army, there's orders. They were due to embark on a ship from Liverpool, so the survivors who were actually fit enough, and it was quite a small number, were put on a train. They were taken down to Liverpool and taken to the dock, to the ship, and at some point, somebody realised that this just didn't make an awful lot of sense. There were very few men. This wasn't a battalion anymore. So many had died and so many were injured. They didn't have much equipment. And their uniforms were in very poor condition. They didn't have full uniforms. What they did have was bloodstained. There were tears on it. They'd been working all day, gathering equipment, trying to help who they could from the crash. So the officers, there was two or three, I believe, were actually kept on board and they did go out with the ship. But the enlisted men were marched back to Lime Street Station so that they could be sent back to Scotland where they could be re-equipped and something could be done for them. And they were put back on yet another train and sent back north to Edinburgh where very, very late on they were finally able to get some proper sleep. Well, we're talking about the First World War. At that time, railways were approaching their zenith and uh, the railways were asked to do things that they weren't initially designed to do. They were carrying an awful lot of extra stock, coal trains in particular, taking coal up to Scapa Flow to the British Grand Fleet, a lot more troop trains, so there were extra passenger trains needed, so the timetables had to be completely altered. On top of all that, um, many of the young men were off to fight in the trenches and the older men were left in charge of running the railway. The troop train at Quintins Hill was composed of six wheel wooden carriages with gas lighting which had been borrowed from another railway. Although in those days all carriages were wooden, they didn't produce steel carriages until after the Second World War. And so you tended to get very old troop trains crammed with troops running at probably faster speeds than they were designed to do. These were a wartime emergency, and they were also extra in terms of the signalmen. These were extra trains that were often put in at short notice and had to run between the timetable trains. Well, we're sitting in a coach very similar to the troop train. Timber construction, and we've lost some of the upholstery. This is first class, believe it or not, um, which would probably have about six officers in it, whereas third class would have eight to ten. This coach being very similar, except that there are no bars on the windows, because after Quintins Hill, bars were taken off windows and also doors were unlocked as well. And sitting, thinking, six o'clock in the morning, uh, only halfway to Liverpool, a long way to go, and then suddenly oblivion. Being timber, the whole carriage would disintegrate, depending on where it was in the train. We've got the gas lighting above there, we've got gas cylinders right under our feet, and the fractured in the accident, gas escaping, coals from the firebox of the locomotives igniting the, the wood, and you've got a conflagration spreading through 15 carriages of a troop train. 
the horrific thing is that these people were trapped, knew that the, the fire was approaching, and at least at one instant, a, an officer actually shot a soldier to prevent him being burned alive. Lesser of two evils. One soldier helped me rescue five men. All along the train, you could hear the groans of the wounded. It was horrible. I'd far rather have been out in Flanders. You get a run for your money there. One of the other problems at Quintins Hill was that you had two trains standing in sidings either side of the main line and a local passenger train shunted onto the main line to allow an express to overtake it. You had various crews of the locos in the signal box legally because they had to sign into a register. The guard of one of the trains was there. The two signalmen, you could imagine there'd be quite a few people there. You could see a reason for a distraction by the signalmen concerned, chatting away to their compatriots and probably talking about the war, of course. I control all the train movements. I do that by making use of the levers here. Black levers work the points, red levers work the signals, and the blue lever is a locking lever, an extra safety device that stops me from pulling the wrong levers. The use of the register here is exactly the same as the use of the register at Quintins Hill. At the start of the day, the signalman will sign himself in, say he's on duty. He has to check the clock, the frame, all the equipment in the signal box, that it's all working properly. If there are any problems, he has to note that in. And then, as the day progresses, he notes down the passage of every train past his signal box, uh, what time it was, and I think he also notes the, his communication with the other signal boxes, like when he gave permission for a train, to come into his section, and so on. And it's a full record of everything that happens in the signal box all day, and at the end of your shift, you have to sign yourself out. I know they swapped shifts, and one guy actually arrived on the local train from where he lived, he hitched a lift. He then took over from the signal man. He actually forgot the train was there, the local train. The relief signal man at Quinton's Hill was arriving regularly late for his six o'clock shift. And he was arriving off the local train usually about 6.30. And it seems that in order for nobody to know that that was happening, the signalman that he replaced was jotting down anything that happened at the signal box between 6 and 6.30 on a separate piece of paper. And then the relief signalman would then copy that down in to the register when he'd arrived. So he's actually writing it retrospectively, which was obviously against the rules. And he's quite possibly doing that um, when the collision occurred. They say if the guy in the signal box had put the collar on the lever, it wouldn't have happened. Well, the collars were very important at Quintins Hill because it does seem that the signalman never applied any of the collars to protect the train, the train from Carlisle, that was on the upline that had been shunted there, that train was not protected. In other words, it was possible the inner home signal on the main line, this one 23 here that we have, it was possible for the signalman to pull that lever. And that's exactly how the crash happened. If the signalman had applied the collar when that train was first shunted onto the line and put that there like that, there's no way he could have released the main inner home signal. Therefore, we couldn't have had a collision. I think the railway, although the official proceedings got away with it, you know, it wasn't the railway's fault, it was the signalman's fault. I think the railway knew fine well that they had a, some guilt because of their slackness of the rules and not getting the signalman to obey all the rules to the letter. And so the signalman were eventually allowed out and went up at their normal business again. On Monday, the 24th of May, 1915, only two days after the crash itself, 101 coffins were taken from the drill hall in Darmeny Street in army wagons, each drawn by two horses, two coffins to a wagon, along a route from the drill hall 
down to Leith Walk, up and along Pilrig Street and into Rosemount Cemetery, where a communal grave had been dug to take the coffins, which were then laid three deep in the grave. The total time taken to move those coffins was some three hours. The funeral happened so quickly after the crash that the men were in Edinburgh and were able and did actually attend the funeral themselves. They were the ones who followed the coffins. Those few that were fit enough, and many of course who were very badly injured, were still in hospital. It wasn't something where they waited days, it happened very quickly. In fact, they cleared the line very quickly of the damaged train. And he was here and was able to go to the funeral. And after that, he was back in the army and they found a space for him in another battalion. So that was in 1915. In 2015, we're reenacting it as much as we can. We are marching behind bands and behind police horses from the drill hall up along to Leith Walk, up and down Pilrig Street, and to the cemetery itself and the memorial. We were very impressed by the service, and in my heart of hearts, I hope it isn't forgotten. I hope it's not just a big show for the 100th anniversary and forgotten so quickly. It's part of our history. It was Britain's worst rail disaster and I think it always will be. It was just such a tragic loss for so little. It was an appalling thing that actually happened. But it's only one of the many, many disasters that happened during the First World War. Leith as a town lost nearly 2,700 people during the course of the war. Not a month passed without some of the Leith battalions being killed. Take away fictitious novels, hide them from my aching sight. Lure me not with worldly pleasures, banish things that give delight. Let me mourn with Leithers mourning for the bravest of the brave, who by someone's careless blunder now are hushed within the grave. I think it was very significant that we were able to hold the actual remembrance so close to the site of the crash, within 50, 100 metres of it, and that we had a full military act of remembrance there. And then at the end of it, the chaplain delivered a blessing, and halfway through the blessing, a London-bound express on the same track that the troop train had been on came thundering past and it was very, very emotional that that was so symbolic of what had happened that morning in 1915. And the chaplain paused, allowed the train to go through and then finished her blessing after it. It was, it was quite extraordinary. Perfect timing for the wrong reason. <laughs> 